Hey Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with the second in a new series pulled straight from you out there in the community. Uh, Steven in our Facebook group suggested a this versus that theme and it's quickly becoming the most popular series on the channel, matching up some of the most popular stocks against each other to see, see which is the better investment. We've got some great stock requests for you this week from AT&T versus Verizon, Stag Industrial versus Realty Income, AMD versus Intel. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Compare some of the most popular stocks in a head-to-head -head grudge match so you know you're always picking the best investments. If you want to suggest some stocks to compare, join the community by tapping that subscribe button and leave me a message in the comments below. I'm going to be using some research and data from Seeking Alpha for this video. If you want to check out more of that analysis, I've set up an exclusive deal for all you out there in the Bowtie Nation. I started writing for Seeking Alpha back in 2011 and wrote for years before joining a venture capital firm and, and private wealth management, but I still use the premium access for research and analysis. Use the link I'll leave below to try Seeking Alpha free, and if you decide Side you like it, you'll get a 50% discount on the premium access. That is $120 off and the lowest price you're going to find online. In fact, it's lower than the price I paid when I started using premium access. But let's get to our semiconductor stocks matchup for this week. Intel, ticker INTC, and AMD, ticker AMD. We looked at AMD versus Nvidia last week. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. And we saw that a lot of these semiconductor stocks having a very hard year last year. What you have to understand here is these semiconductors or chips are like the brain center in the front of everything electronic. And they had huge demand during the pandemic when everyone was buying new laptops and everyone was gaming at home as the demand from cars. All of these, all this demand caused a semiconductor shortage, caused prices to rocket, and these semiconductor companies did very well. But a lot of that demand was pulled forward, and now the demand has just fallen flat for laptops, for gaming, for Bitcoin mining, for a lot of things. So this, this, uh, this semiconductor industry is highly cyclical. It goes through this all the time, where we see a, just a crush of demand, prices go up, the stocks do very well, and then flat lines for a couple of years. That's what we're in right now. Whatever you buy though now, when all is down and all, all the stocks are down, it's a great time to buy your favorite semiconductor stocks because those that cycle will renew. We will once again see that semiconductor demand and a lot of these stocks are gonna take off. I wanna start off as we do with the sales growth of the two companies. You see AMD up at the top here, I, Intel at the bottom. You see the, uh, the last revenue growth year over year and then the forward expected revenue growth there. You also see the sector median as well as the five-year average for each of these. Again, what I want to do here is I want to see that a stock is growing its sales faster than the sector median or faster than its industry just to see which companies might have some kind of a competitive advantage that is allowing that faster sales growth. I also want to see stocks that have faster sales growth compared to their five-year average. So five-year average that is higher than the sector median and then a stock that is also growing that momentum, increasing that momentum for faster sales growth near term. And here we see a tale of two different worlds, right? We see AMD with 53% sales growth over the last year, 36% pace over the last five years against a sector median of about 17%. So outperforming its own five-year average, outperforming the sector median, expected to be about 37% over the next year as that sector, as the, as the semiconductor chip demand slows down and we see some weakness from these companies. But then you look at Intel, negative 11% sales growth over the last year. They've actually seen lower sales over the last year, just 4.5% over the last five years. So something clearly wrong with Intel over the last five years, especially against its own competitors, AMD, NVIDIA, a lot of the other semiconductor stocks we've looked at. And what you understand here when you're comparing two stocks, folks, is that there is a reasoning behind these numbers, okay? It is not just who has the higher sales growth, who has the lower, who has the higher profitability that we'll look at or the lower valuations. There is a reason behind these numbers that you have to understand. You have to understand if that's baked into the price right now and if there might be a change in the future. A lot of Intel investors want to say that, yes, all this bad sales growth, all the lower profitability is baked into the stock right now. If there is a some kind of a change in management or some kind of a change in strategy, then that stock can still be a good investment, even, even on these past numbers. What you need to understand, though, is, is that true? You need to look at these numbers. You need to see if it says some kind of competitive advantage or disadvantage in the stock. You need to look at the news to see if, uh, if there's any kind of a hint that that might be changing and which stock would be the better investment right now. But if we look at profitability here, and all this is available on Seeking Alpha there in the analysis, 
if we look at profitability here, it appears that Intel is doing better on a gross profit margin. It is about the same, pretty close to what uh, AMD is reporting on gross profit. EBIT, EBITDA margin, all those profit, key profitability statistics. But I want you to notice one thing about this. One thing that you have to watch for in your stocks is the trend in these. You'll notice that the AMD five-year average is lower than all of those near-term trends. Okay, so AMD 43% gross margin over the last five years, now at 51%. Uh, EBIT margin, 11.8% over the last five years, now at 13%. EBITDA margin, that key operating profitability, that key operating profit, the earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation was about 15.5% over the last five years on average, now at 24%. So AMD is getting more efficient. It is turning more of those sales into profits for the company. But for Intel, the story is quite the opposite. Intel is actually getting less profitable, less efficient at turning those sales into profits in the near term here. Gross profit of 46% is lower than the five-year average at 57%. The EBIT margin, earnings before interest and taxes, that profitability is 11.5%, less than half the almost 30% EBIT margin that it booked on average over the last five years. So not only is Intel falling behind in terms of sales growth, especially against its competitors, its key competitors in semiconductors, it is also getting less profitable, less efficient at turning those sales into profits. So that is something that we need to figure out in the story here if that might eventually change and what it means for Intel versus AMD. And we know Intel's problems really started about five or six years ago on its 10 nanometer chip. It missed production deadlines on that for, for years. Uh, it actually ended up releasing a chip that was only good really for laptops. And that's when AMD really pulled ahead in servers, in data center component, you know, those chips of being used in data centers uh, for enterprise customers. It really took a lot of the market share away from Intel when Intel disappointed on that 10 nanometers chip. It has only gotten worse. It's fallen behind now in its seven nanometer chips. And that's really the first of two problems for Intel right now is one, it's its competitive advantage. Okay, the company has been forced to admit to several design and manufacturing problems over the last few years, first with that 10 nanometer chip, and then with delays on its seven nanometer as well. Now, one thing that really kind of shocked me is in a big, hairy, awe-inspiring goal, CEO Gelsinger wants us to believe that Intel is going to develop five node advancements, so five big chip improvements in four years. Okay, five chip advancements in four years. That's something that would normally take about 10 years, even for a company that's firing on all cinder cylinders for its research machine. Uh, and, and Intel now wants us to believe that it's going to be able to cut that time in half despite that history of problems. Now, the other problem for Intel, as I see it right now, is a problem of focus. Okay, so what you understand is most chip companies either design or they build their semiconductors, but they don't necessarily do both. They either do the research and development and the design behind the chips, and then they have someone else fabricate them, someone else manufacture them, or vice versa. Uh, AMD designs its chips, but then it has TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, handled that fabrication. And it's something that TSMC does undeniably the best in the world at doing. In fact, TSMC manufactures or fabricates about 90% of the advanced chips in the world. It is that good at what it does. Um, now, the problem here is that Intel used to be very good at doing both of these, at designing and fabricating chips. Uh, but it just kind of, you know, it, it fell behind in both of them, actually. But the problem here is Intel is now planning on launching a foundry service, so a fabricating service for other companies. Now, somehow, the company that uh, couldn't get its own chips designed and built on time is going to try sell telling other, uh, other semiconductor companies that, hey, we'll manufacture your chips for you. And the problem here is that designing chips takes a lot of research money, a lot of research and development, building out the manufacturing facilities takes a lot of capital as well. So, you know, I don't think Intel really has the capital to do both of these. It's really going to be kind of splitting its attention to try to do both things at once instead of going back to doing one thing very well. Now, of course, what Intel investors want to look at is the valuations. We looked at this last week with AMD versus, versus NVIDIA. AMD trading for 4.5 times on a price to sales basis. Now, that is a 33% discount to the five-year average of 6.8. So even shares of AMD are down, shares of NVIDIA are down, but to, are costing more much more, about 10 times on a price to sales basis. But if we look at Intel, look at Intel on this price to sales basis, this trailing 12 months, 1.77 times. 
That is a 40% discount to the five-year average, which is in itself was only about half of the AMD five-year average for a price to sell. So of course, the big question becomes, what is priced into shares of Intel? Can it come back from the problems that it's had in the past? And does that make it a good value right now against a lot of these other semiconductor stocks, which are a little bit more expensive? So shares of AMD, even though they're down 33% over the last, from the five-year average price to sales multiple, trade in at 4.5 times on a price to sales, which is a place that I like it at is it is that 1.7 times on a price to sales basis for shares of Intel attractive enough to draw to bring investors in on the hope that uh, it might be able to change its business somehow. And honestly, I just don't see it happening. I do not see Intel being able to make five chip improvements over the next four years, something that would normally take 10 years, even for a good chip company. I think CEO, CEO Gelsinger is basically just coming to the market, making a big hairy promise. And then he's gonna go to the researchers, the developers at Intel and say, hey, we've made the problem promise, we have to deliver on it and let them figure it out. Well, I don't think they're gonna be able to figure out, especially when Intel is now developing Dividing its focus between the chip design and trying to launch a fabrication service, I think something that isn't going to go well because it is going to go up against the, the heavyweight of the industry, TSMC, and I just don't see why customers are going to pick Intel to fabricate its chips when TSMC does very well. Honestly, the only way Intel comes back is if uh, China invades Taiwan, blows up TSMC, and, uh, and customers have to go to Intel for their fabrication. I think, unfortunately, that is the only way Intel is the better stock here. So I have to give the edge to AMD. And we'll get back to our stock list, but I want to show you how to analyze these stocks so you always know that you're picking the best investments. We covered some of the fundamental criteria in last week's video, why we're looking at sales growth, profitability, what we're looking for in those and in valuations. But right now, I want to talk about something even more important. Uh, we can compare sales growth, profitability, those valuations across stocks, but more importantly is to compare them each company against the average for its industry and its sector. Now that's important because while AMD and Intel might be in the same industry, so you can compare the two against each other, some of our other matchups like last week's Tesla versus Amazon just are in widely different businesses. You really can't compare the fundamentals against each other in the same way because those industries are so different. Uh, for example, Amazon's operating profitability is just 2.6% while Tesla's is 16.7%, you know, more than six times higher. Tesla has grown revenue by 50% pace over the past year, while Amazon sales is just up 9% in that period. You know, so if you just look at the numbers on that basis, comparing them against each other, does that mean that Tesla is a good investment? Well, you should avoid Amazon. And like we saw last week, it's not necessarily true because we have no idea if those numbers are good or bad in each company's industry, you know, electric vehicles versus e-commerce. It's only by doing that comparison, comparing each company against its industry average that we can see which company is really doing a better job of beating those averages in its own industry. Uh, that way we can start to see which company has the stronger, the more defensible competitive advantage against its own peers, it might be taking market share, might be more efficient and converting more of those sales into dollars. That's why last week we also compared Amazon and when we were comparing Amazon and Tesla, we also compared Amazon to like Etsy and Microsoft and Tesla against GM and Neo, comparing them directly with competitors in their industry to see who really has the strongest competitive advantages. Next we have our big real estate dividend names, Realty Income ticker O and Stag Industrial ticker STAG. Realty Income of course has billed itself as the monthly dividend rate, paying that monthly dividend consistently the only dividend the only real estate stock in the dividend aristocrats holding mostly retail property types stag industrial for its part an industrial and warehouse property also with a very nice dividend we'll compare growth for the two companies first and i love that seeking alpha shows us the adjusted funds from operations instead of earnings instead of sales folks you cannot use earnings when you're looking at real estate stocks Earnings are skewed lower by so much depreciation for that real estate that it's really not a good measure of actual cash flow for the company. So you have to have to use what's called either funds from operation, FFO, or adjusted funds from operation. That is really backing into the actual funds received from the real estate in its uh, in its operations. And we can look here at the five-year historical CAGR, so the, the compound annual growth rate, and then the year-over-year -year growth rate for AFFO for each of these. We can see for stag on the top here growing at about one and a half percent annualized over the last five years that is just below its sector median its property type medium about 1.7 percent 
the AFFO growth over the last year at 9.7% versus a 7.5% sector median. So it does appear that while it is underperformed on a five-year basis as far as funds from operations, it is developing that momentum. It is growing faster over the last year, growing funds from operations at 10% or realty income on the bottom here, growing quite a bit faster, 4.5% annually over the last five years, doing very much better than the sector median. But we do see a difference here in the year over year. In the last year, realty income has only grown by 5.9% versus the sector median of 7.5%. So very much more lagging, losing some of its momentum uh, relative to the sector over the last year. One thing that does worry me about realty income, and you see that in some of those gross statistics, is how it sets its leases up uh, to keep that occupancy rate high, which realty income has an occupancy rate of about 98%, which is, is better than the REIT industry average at around 96, 97%. But to keep that occupancy rate up, it builds in extremely low rent escalators, annual rent escalators into its leases of around 1%. So rent really doesn't, a lot of times, doesn't even keep up with inflation, but tenants never leave because it's because it is such a great deal that the company never has, has to worry about getting paid. And cap rates, capitalization rates on leases are generally set up with about 6% cap rate, which means the company gets paid about 6% return on its property, on what it paid for the properties each year, plus that low annual escalator on the rent. Now that's going to mean that any really kind of stock appreciation, so all of that rent is just going to satisfy the dividend, right? And any upside appreciation on the stock is going to have to come from acquisitions. It's going to have to come from the company seeking out, getting good deals on properties, and turning that into cash flow. The problem here is that with interest rates rising higher, it is going to be harder to find those very profitable properties. Okay, Obviously, real estate is very highly leveraged. Anytime increase in uh, interest rates increase, it becomes a very much harder to find a profitable uh a profitable real estate to be able to then rent out at that kind of 6% cap rate as well as the, the rent escalators. Now to increase that growth, realty income has tried to shift to another property type. Historically, it's just been in that retail space and convenience store real property type. Now it's going into the acquisition with the Encore property from Win. So going into that gambling and gaming property type, that could give it a little bit more growth, but then you have that trade-off with gaming being extremely cyclical. So anytime the a recession hits, anytime the economy falls, gambling, gaming, Las Vegas always gets hit harder. So I wonder if they're not sacrificing some of that cash flow safety they've always had with the convenience stores and drug stores and retail stores, gas stations for a little bit more growth, but then that unpredictability in that growth. Of course, all this isn't to say that stag industrial doesn't have problems as well. Okay, the pandemic saw a massive build out of industrial and warehouse space to satisfy all that demand for e-commerce shipping you know, all those distribution uh, warehouses that amazon and others thought that they were going to need now of course that space is overbuilt and the rates are coming down which is hurting stag industrial it is attributed to a lot of the drop in stag prices stag stock over the last year but e-commerce is just an unstoppable trend right online retail sales are still just 15 percent of total retail sales and growing each year so even though we have right now an overbuilding of industrial and warehouse space, then that e-commerce trend is going to keep on growing. We're going to eventually need all of that space. And I think rates are going to go up. And that's why I like Stag over the long term. Looking at the valuations here, we do see that both of these stocks are actually trading more expensive than the sector average, more expensive than the REIT sector average. We do see here up at the top that Stag is trading for 19 times on that price to adjusted FFO, adjusted funds from operations versus a 16 times median for the industry. We see for realty income below trading for 17.1 times on that price to adjusted funds from operations against that 16 times median. So we do see that while we are expecting more growth from Stag Industrial, the shares of realty income are priced a little bit more attractively. So there is a trade-off there. And I think it's a trade-off that probably makes these kind of a push. You know, if you do like realty income, if you do like that monthly cash flow and the retail property space and the potential in those gaming properties, then maybe you go with real realty income because it is, even though it's lower growth, then it is uh, it is going to benefit from that lower valuation. If you want the, the longer term trend to e-commerce, you want that higher growth, then maybe you go with stag industrial.
We've got our big dividend stocks next, AT&T versus Verizon. But again, don't miss last week's video comparing Amazon, Tesla, NVIDIA, and Google. I'm going to put a link to that in the description below. Check that out. Here for revenue growth, we do see AT&T outperforming over the last year with 4.5% revenue growth uh, versus Verizon of just 1%. Furthermore, it does appear that AT&T is building that momentum, revenue growth of just 1% over the last five years, so increasing that 344% above that five-year average there, whereas Verizon is slowing down. So Verizon reported a five-year average revenue growth of 1.5% a year there. Now it's down to 1%, so it is losing that momentum for some reason in its revenue growth. On a profitability basis, we see very similar numbers here for gross profit of 54% for AT&T versus 57% there for Verizon. So Verizon appears to be a little bit more profitable on its gross side. For EBITDA margin though, that core operating profitability of earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, 34% for shares of AT&T versus 32% for Verizon. So something in that operating profitability, something in those operating expenses makes AT&T the better profitable company here. What is really interesting though is the trend in each of these. In each of these operating profitabilities, in gross profit, EBITDA margin, EBIT margin, AT&T becoming more profitable than its five-year average. If you look at these five-year averages, 53% over the last five years for gross profit for AT&T, now at 54%. EBITDA margin was 31% over the last five years on average, now it is at 34%. So very much getting more profitable, finding a way to squeeze out more, more earnings out of those sales. The number is the, exactly the opposite for Verizon though, getting less profitable, 58%. Five-year average gross profit margin down to 57%. 36% five-year average for EBITDA margin now down to 32%. So for some reason, Verizon is becoming less efficient, less profitable than it has been over its five years. Now, in a very mature market like telecom carriers, there is really very little incentive among the three major carriers to be overly competitive, okay? Between AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, between the three, they control 90% of the wireless market. So there is no reason for them to undercut each each other on prices. Uh, there is no reason to really go too far for growth and that really it's all about efficiency here. You really want to look at which companies are the most efficient at turning those sales into dollars uh, because the growth probably isn't going to be there as we saw with the growth statistics here. Uh, you just almost no sales growth so you need to get the most out of it. On a valuation basis, we do see that AT&T here at up at the top is the more attractive on a valuation basis. We can look at the price to earnings over the last 12 months, 6.8 times on a price to earnings basis. That is below the, the five year average of 8.7 times. So it is cheaper than it has been in the past five years. Verizon trading at 7.9 times, so more expensive than shares of AT&T on that relative basis, but also at a steep discount from its five-year average. 11.2 times on a five-year average PE basis there. That's about 30% discount for shares of Verizon right now. Of course, both of these great dividend stocks, no problem paying the dividends, and I think investors can be happy with either of these very high-yield stocks, but I have to give the edge to AT&T on this one. First on that lower valuation and the lower payout ratio. Lower payout ratio just means a potential potential for stronger dividend growth, as well as holding more of those earnings back that can be fed into faster growth for the company. I also like the renewed focus for AT&T, now spinning off the satellite and the, the, the media AOL segment of this, a renewed focus on telecom to really compete with its, with its competitors, uh, T-Mobile and Verizon. I think that's going to do very well for AT&T over the year. Let me know in the comments below which stocks you want to see compared next, or click on the video to the right for our comparison of Tesla, NVIDIA, Google, and Amazon. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.